Let's begin today by looking into the past. You're living in the United States in the late 1800s. You're a young person, but dating as we know it today doesn't really exist. If you wanted to get to know someone romantically, you couldn't just ask them out to dinner or a movie. Instead, the process was called calling. A young man would come to a young woman's home and call to her, usually through the woman's parents. The young man would sit in the family's parlor, which is kind of like today's living room, and talk to their romantic interest, usually with her parents or family close by, listening in. Nothing screams romance more than mom and dad sitting in the room, right? Well, the goal of these meetings wasn't just to have fun or to get to know each other better. As Maura Weigel's book on the history of dating points out, these chaperone at-home meetings were to decide if the young man had intentions to marry their daughter. Talk about a high-pressure situation. This was a time when romantic relationships were mostly about family connections and securing a marriage into a higher class, rather than personal happiness, companionship, or even love. But that was all about to change. As we entered the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution concentrated work around large factories, and more and more young people were moving to cities for employment. This urban lifestyle created a brand new way to meet people. Instead of meeting a potential partner through family connections, young men and women could meet each other on their own in workplaces, department stores, and other public places. Suddenly, the pool of potential life partners multiplied, and so did the myth and magic of finding true love. For example, Weigel tells us how a young woman working as a sales girl at a big store like Lord & Taylor in New York City might interact with dozens of new people each day, something that was almost impossible in smaller, more traditional communities. This independence, coupled with the happenstance of meeting new people each day, was the beginning of what we now think of as dating. As young people enjoyed this new freedom, they began to meet up in places like theaters, dance halls, and amusement parks. Dating became an activity done outside the home, which was a big shift from being under the watchful eye of parents. But of course, dating wasn't free, and many young women who had lower paying jobs or no jobs at all couldn't afford to go out on their own. So it became common for men to pay for these outings, whether it was a movie ticket or a meal. However, this shift did not come without controversy. In the early 1900s, as Weigel reports, some authorities didn't understand this new dating culture and saw it as suspicious. In New York City, the vice squad arm of some police departments monitored young couples going out together, and some young women were wrongly arrested on suspicion of being involved in illegal activities just because they accepted dinner or movie tickets from men. One group of women called Charity Girls took advantage of the city's dating scene by going out with men who would treat them to meals and fun activities. These young women were not breaking any laws, but they were criticized by people who thought this arrangement was improper. As Weigel states, even prostitutes criticized Charity Girls because they thought the Charity Girls would put them out of business. For charity girls, dating was a chance to experience city life in ways their small salaries couldn't afford on their own. Additionally, it gave women a power they had not held in previous practices of courtship. Later, in the 1920s, dating became more widely accepted and even glamorous. Movies, magazines, and radio shows started portraying dating as an exciting activity to meet new people and for couples to be seen in public. Media showed couples going out to dance, eat, and have fun, making dating seem like another desirable consumer activity. Businesses quickly saw this as an opportunity, creating what some called the dating economy. Restaurants, theaters, and amusement parks catered specifically to young people on dates, making dating a central part of social life. For the first time, dating wasn't just about finding a marriage partner, it was also about fun and social status. This was a big shift in how people thought about romance and relationships. As time went on, dating continued to evolve, and it took another giant leap with the rise of the internet in the late 20th century. Online dating websites like Match.com and later dating apps like Tinder and Bumble changed the way people approached dating. 
Instead of meeting people at work or through friends, people could now connect with potential partners from anywhere by creating a profile, selecting photos, and advertising themselves. This new approach turned dating into a kind of marketplace where people could shop for romance just as early 1900 shop girls would see potential romantic partners in their customers. The difference with dating apps is that they allowed users to meet beyond their immediate social circle and even beyond their local area. This shift gave people a lot more control over who they met, but it also further cemented the consumer mindset around dating. As Weigel claims, people now looked at dating profiles the way they might look at products on a shelf, choosing potential mashes based on how well they fit specific criteria. Today, dating is both exciting and challenging. According to Weigel, dating itself has become like a form of work, requiring energy, time, and effort in marketing oneself. People have to put in the work to make profiles, go on dates, and try to find a good match. This modern dating culture reflects society's values, where people now prioritize personal happiness and compatibility, but also view dating with a consumer mentality. In many ways, dating today still echoes the past. Although technology has changed how we meet people, the same questions remain. Is dating about finding a life partner, or is it more about enjoying the experience? Modern dating culture is a mix of personal exploration, social expectations, and even consumer economics, reflecting the changes in how we view relationships and even how we view ourselves. Dating has certainly come a long way from those late 1800s calling sessions supervised by family members. Today, dating is a part of life that involves independence, personal choice, and sometimes even strategic planning. As we look to the future, it's worth asking, Will dating continue to be shaped by technology, or could we see a return to simpler, community-centered ways of meeting people? Whatever the result, it's likely that dating will reflect the values of the society in which romantic partners live. I hope this brief history of dating and courtship gave you a better understanding of how romance has evolved, and maybe some food for thought on where it's headed next. Oh my gosh, I can actually see where it's headed.